see a couple of people dropping on board. If folks could give me some thumbs up that you're hearing me okay and that you're seeing this live feed. We can get started on today's virtual keeper chat. Hello, Hannah and Mackenzie. Okay, it looks like um, folks are seeing us. So we are live here at the Buttonwood Park Zoo. Good morning, Kathy. Um, we are getting ready to start our virtual keeper chat. Just want to announce the winner of yesterday's drawing for the beautiful painting by Ruthie. And it was actually um, Kathy Tilly won the painting from Ruthie. So congratulations to Kathy. And um, you can reach out to Carrie Hawthorne um, with the details on how to get that painting. So once again, we're live here at the Buttonwood Park Zoo in New Bedford. I know it looks like we're on the docks of New Bedford. Um, so I just uh, to give you a hint, we are not outside. We are actually inside at the moment. It's a little cool and breezy today. So we decided to come inside once more to our rainforest rivers and reef building. And um, we are in a portion of the building at an exhibit that's one of my personal favorites. It's one of our more interactive areas. Um, we are actually at our touch tank today. So I'm gonna back up a little bit and you can see what I was panned in on was a beautiful mural um, that was done by Arthur Moniz for us, a print of um, a pretty, pretty favorite or familiar um, painting of the docks of New Bedford. So we're gonna be joined today again by one of our favorite uh, staff, mer staff members, our aquarist Kyle. He's gonna be talking to you all about our touch tank and all the critters that live in that tank. So go ahead and take it away, Kyle. How are you guys doing today? Well, like Shara said, we're at our touch tank, which a lot of you guys who have been to the zoo before recognize very fondly. Uh, the animals here are missing you guys. They miss everybody coming over and getting to learn about them. So I'm actually going to give you guys a little bit of a choice today first right off the bat because we have so many different animals in this tank and so many different types of animals in this tank I don't want to not give you guys enough information so would you guys rather hear about the sharks in the skate which are considered elasmobranchs or would you guys rather hear about the invertebrates which are the guys that have no bones which are sea stars sea urchins, crabs, periwinkles, things like that. So if you guys want to comment in the little comment section about what you want to hear about more, we'll focus on that one. And then at another time, we'll do the other group. Like I said, I just don't want to jip you guys on information. All right, so we'll give you guys a minute to just answer. So once again, if folks are interested in hearing about the skate and the sharks that we have in this tank, um, shout that out in the comment box. Um, or if you're interested in learning more about the invertebrates in the tank, like the sea urchins and sharks, please, Lindsay is saying. So wait for, oh, Tegan is saying sharks too. I'm sensing a, yep, Lori, sharks, please, and thank you. All right, so, so far, I think the consensus is they'd like to hear a little bit more about those critters. Perfect. All right, guys, so we'll save the invertebrates, which are, gonna, which are sea stars, anything that doesn't have a backbone that's in here for another day. We're gonna talk about elasmobranchs, which are one of my favorites, actually, which is super cool. So elasmobranchs are a group of fish that include sharks, skates, rays, and chimeras. And you guys are probably knowing what most of those are. Uh, for everybody who doesn't know, a chimera is actually a deep water animal. Uh, they also call them rat tails. Uh, we don't have any here at the zoo, obviously, but if you guys want to look them up, they are super cool. But we do have two elasmobranchs in the tank. Right now, you guys are seeing our little skate, and she just swam right over our chain dogfish, one of the, the couple that we have here at our touch tank. And when I'm saying elasmobranchs, what I'm basically referring to is that group of those animals that I listed, and what makes them very unique and different from any other fish, because those guys are fish, is the fact that their bones are actually made out of cartilage. So everybody at home, if you guys reach up, touch the tips of your ears, okay? I'm not gonna have you touch your nose, but just touch the tips of your ears. You feel that kind of resistant but squishy material? That is cartilage. So that's what these guys' bones are made out of, the same stuff that's in your ears and the very, very tip of your nose. And that makes them different from any other fish that actually has 
bones just like you and I do. So that both the elasmobranchs or the sharks and rays that we have in this tank, the skate I should say, are right here from Massachusetts. So these guys are all local to our waters right around here. The one you're looking at right now is a chain dogfish. They're also known as chain cat sharks. They're a super cool, uh, fairly deep water shark. They usually sit right around 50 feet, 60 feet, but they can go all the way down to about uh, 200. They've even been spotted at about 2,000 feet. The big thing for these guys is they like cooler water. So we keep our touch tank right at 60 degrees, 59, 60 degrees all the time. These guys can actually go all the way down to almost 50 degrees. So that's pretty cold water when you think about it. Not water that people want to be swimming in a lot. And we have two males in the tank. Both these guys are boys right now. And they each have a unique pattern. So if you look at the pattern of a chain dogfish, you can actually tell individuals from each other. So the guy that you're looking at right now, if you look at the top of his head, the way we tell him apart, he's got one big pattern right in the middle. So you see that big kind of squarey blotchy thing right there. And then the other one has the same basic pattern, but it's actually got a line straight through the middle and it's divided. So I know this one, we actually, we originally named him two, very original. And then that one's one for the one block and the two block. So like I said, each one of these guys are chain dogfish. And I'm just gonna go over sharks in general very quickly. Like I said, they're elasmobranchs, so their skeletal structure is made of, out of that cartilage. And they are that many, many, many different types of sharks and they have been around for hundreds and hundreds of millions of years. So they're a very old, old animal. Uh, all sharks are carnivorous. So there's no sharks that eat plant material or algae or anything like that. But there are a couple of filter feeding sharks. The largest fish in the world is actually a shark, and then the smallest shark in the world is only about three or four inches. So they go all the way from 40 feet to three inches. So sharks are a very huge, very diverse group of animal that lives in our oceans. A couple of you guys at home may be wondering why is he not swimming? I thought sharks had to swim to breathe. I'm sure they're getting that question all the time. Uh, not all sharks have to swim all the time to breathe just the ones that we always hear about. So you always hear about the white sharks, the mako sharks, the hammerhead sharks, things like that. Those guys have to swim around to push the water over their gills to breathe. These guys are able to do what's called buccal pumping. So they can open their mouth, close their mouth, and the opening and closing of their mouth pushes the water over their gills. So that's why these guys and a lot of, a lot of other species of shark can just sit at the bottom, relax, not move around at times, and breathe perfectly fine. So I'm actually kind of zoomed in so folks can kind of see the gills moving. Perfect, because I was just about to talk about the gills. So other cool thing about sharks that makes them very different from other fish is instead of having, I've talked about it in my other chats where a fish has a covering over its gill called an operculum and they just have that one thing that opens in and out, okay? Sharks actually have gill slits, okay? And there's, the six gill shark has six, most other sharks have Six, uh, five, excuse me. So they have the gill slits that are opening and closing. So they don't have that nice covering on their gills like other fish do. That makes them a little bit more, um, a little different, excuse me, not a little more. They make it different than other fish out there. So sharks, even though they are fish, they're very different from those bony fish. So we have a question about um, whether or not these guys fight at all in the tank. Nope. Uh, chain dog fish or chain cat sharks are very relaxed sharks. They don't really go crazy unless we're feeding them. Then they start to get a little excited. They, for the most part, are just gonna kind of hang out and blend in with the bottom, wait for food to come by. They're not hyper aggressive towards each other. They're not a solitary shark either. They can actually be found schooled up with a lot of them hanging out, piled up on top of each other. So they're not gonna be fighting with themselves or anybody else in this tank at all. So Logan age eight is asking, what do these guys eat? So in the wild, when they're younger, these guys would be eating marine worms and other soft body prey that they can find on the bottom. As they get older, which both of our guys in here are fully grown male adults, they will start to switch towards eating fish, small um, cephalopods, so small squids and things like that as well too. Um, so 
Um, Tegan H8 wants to know, how did we get these guys? That's a great question. So because these guys are from right around here off our coast, they come in very, very readily as a thing called bycatch. So fishermen are out there dragging humongous nets and unfortunately they get a lot of other things besides what they're actually wanting to fish for. These guys come in fairly, fairly regularly. Uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute was kind enough to donate both these sharks to us and a couple of eggs that we were able to hatch out. So we do have some babies up in the back, but we're focusing on the big guys right now. And they breed pretty well in fish tanks, so you can do that as well too. I think that was Tegan's next question is, do we breed them at all? We do not. Um, we have two boys in the tank right now. Um, and they're me, pretty easy to come by. Would the, you say the boys or the chain dog fish? The chain dog fish. The chain dog fish. Oh yeah, they're very very easy to come by. Uh, they are a species of least concern out there in the ocean, and they're actually a little bit on a population upkick because we're taking out a lot of their major predators like Atlantic cod, uh, which is a species of huge concern right now, not only for its commercial value but because the numbers are absolutely plummeting out there in the ocean. They love to eat these guys as long as and the, the haddock and the pollock. So all those big white flaky fish that everybody loves to eat um, are the predators of these guys and we are taking them out by the millions so these guys are doing great with them their main predators being gone but it's definitely some drawbacks to that as well and so jessica's asking um how fast can they swim because these guys are obviously they, pretty quiet and they here. are not fast swimmers at all whatsoever so if you look at their tails if we can get an opportunity you'll notice that the top lobe of the tail super duper long bottom lobe with the tail. That's called a heterocycle tail. All sharks have that. But the closer the top lobe is to the bottom of the tail on any fish dictates about how quickly they can really, really swim and how streamlined they are. If you look at these guys, it's a dramatic, dramatic top tail. So it's gonna be like this and like this. So they cannot generate a lot of swim fast. They're not meant to swim fast. They're not the Makos of the world or the blue sharks of the world that are swimming around. Uh, are slow swimmers. So Tegan's asking, um, where do they live? They live right around the Atlantic coast. So they're going to be on, in the Atlantic Ocean, right along the coastline. Not super far, far out, but they definitely want the deeper, cooler water. So like I said, anywhere between, normally you're going to find about 200 to 1,000 feet. Uh, in the winter, they can come in a little bit shallower, but it's mostly that cold water. So right around 200 feet is where you're going to find them almost all the time. Um, so Sarah I uh, was wondering if we are open yet, so I will I will answer that question. We are still currently closed. Um, don't have any additional details. Um, I encourage you to check back to our Facebook page and our um, web page, and we'll be given updates to go along. But we are currently closed, which is why we're doing these virtual keeper chats to just um, stay connected to our visitors and to our community. Um, Serenity Love is asking, uh, do these guys react to music or noise at all? Um, I mean, they're not going to react to music as its own individual entity, but if you definitely, if you make a loud, a loud, loud, startling noise, they're definitely going to react. Um, just like anything else in the world would, they don't like to be startled. They don't like noise that's alarming. So they, they're not going to react like positively or negatively. They're just going to try to get away from that startling interference. All right. So you can see the skate just disturbed one of these yep, guys so a little bit. So he's resettled. repositioning himself, but you can see him sort of swimming along and how he moves. And you can get a better look at that tail that yep. you were describing. So you're saying that, I mean, you can could, you could talk about swi uh, fish locomotion and swimming for hours and hours and hours but see how his whole body's undulating the whole thing it's not just that tail fin like a tuna moving real quick so it, it's going to show you guys that they do not swim fast uh, and fast is a relative term when it comes to swimming too some animals you might think they're moving fast but if you compare it to other ones it's not not very fast at all these guys are burst swimmers they can swim quick at a short distance but they're not going to sustain any sort of fast fast swimming and so he's looking for That's another spot so yeah he's just like walking around looking for a good spot the skate is very excited today, so we'll actually jump oh, over sure. to her because I can talk about sharks for years. <laughs> so this is a skate. Uh, a lot of people may think it's a stingray, but it's actually not. Uh, one of the big differences between a stingray and a skate, stingray's body is tend to be circular. Uh, if you see the skate, she's got all sorts of different angles. It kind of tapers up towards her nose. Uh, 
Uh, you can see the fins behind, it's not just a perfect circle. And also, if you look at the tip of her tail, you'll see some fins on there, little finlets. Um, she does not have that very stiff, hard tail with the stinger on it, like a stingray would. So these guys are skates. Uh, again, cartilaginous fish, so those bones that are made out of the same stuff as your ears and your nose. Um, and they are very closely related to the stingrays, things like that. But these guys are bottom-dwelling species, and she is a little skate. So another species that we have right here in Massachusetts that lives in the semi-deep, cooler water off of our coast and along the Atlantic coast. So there was a qu really great question. Um from Trinity, uh, age seven. Mm -hmm. How does the touch tank get cleaned? Are all the animals removed? That's a great, great question. So, actually, if you guys come over here, I'll show you. So all the water comes out of these little um, PVC pipes. That's where it's coming from, the filtration. So it travels the entire length of this tank, and the water mixes around fairly well, okay? And it goes down these pipes over here, and then these pipes go through the wall behind me. I don't know if you guys can see that. But behind me, and they come out through the wall. And we have a big filtration system that, just like you guys would have on your swimming pool, something like that at home. And it cleans all the water. So I don't have to take these animals out of the tank to clean it. I can have the filtration system do it for me. I will spot clean, take food that they don't eat out of the tank. Uh, the hermit crabs do a good job of helping me out with that as well, and the sea stars. But no, I don't have to take the animals out of the tank unless there was an absolute emergency and I had to really do something. So Beth is asking, does the skate breathe air like a whale? Uh, she's wondering why she's occasionally coming up oh. to the surface. <laughs> she's coming up to the surface because she thinks uh, I'm gonna feed her, which I will later, um, but she's just excited. They do not breathe air. So I can't say no fish breathes air because some do air gulp. Uh, they have gills, they're designed to breathe in the water, so what they do is they remove the oxygen from the water, uh, just like we remove the oxygen from the air using those gills. She's coming up to the surface, like I said, just because she's super excited, thinking I'm gonna about to give her some food. So Tegan was asking, can they um, be taken out of the water? So the funny thing about fish gills is they actually can breathe better in air than we can, but the problem is fish gills are designed to be wet to maximize the surface area. So when we take them out of the water, their, their gills dry up and sit on top of each other and they can't breathe at all. But their gills are very, very good at breathing in water. Let's so see. to answer your question, if you can keep their gills wet and keep them wet, they can breathe out of, out of the water very, very well. But I wouldn't try it at home because that's not something that you guys should be doing. And so Lindsay's asking if um, skates have the ability to sting. They do not. So stingrays have the, the bar that can stay, it doesn't really, it, that will stab you and you can get envenomated from that. Skates do not. And I, she does have spines all along her back and she will kind of hit you with those with her tail. Um, they're not venomous or anything like that. They, they don't feel great, it's like being poked with little needles. Uh, and they will bite you, you know, if you really start bothering them a lot too. Right, I'm hoping and that sort of speaks to um, just her coloring. I was hoping she would come up on the glass so I could get a good look. When we, at feed, we will be feeding her later, so when I do that, I will make sure to put it right on the glass so you guys can get a fantastic look at her underside and we can talk about how that works and things like that. So she, can, where are her eyes? Can she actually see yep. me? Because she's obviously see coming up. Right because... here, where my fingers are? Mm -hmm. Those are her eyes. Okay. So her, so the skate's eyes are on top of their head, which is designed for a bottom living life. And then right behind her eyes, she actually has spiracles, which are like holes. So when she breathes, all she does is she opens those spiracles, water comes in, so they're right there. One's there, one's there. And then underneath are her gills. So she never sucks water into her gills or through her mouth because she can suck in the mud. She sucks it in through the spiracles and pushes it out through her gills. That's an adaptation to living on the bottom. So a lot of people think those are her eyes, but her eyes are actually just in front, right. dorsal to that. So um, just uh, really quick, quick to answer um, Lee's question, who was the winner of the painting that Ruthie did yesterday? That was Kathy Tilly. Um, so congratulations to her, and thank you for everybody that donated. 
um, and was part of that drawing. Quick question from Marco wants to know, are these guys scaly or smooth? So the skate or the shark, Marco? I guess both. Okay, so sh all sharks have scales. Their scales are actually called denticles. Under a microscope, a shark's scales look like teeth or facing backwards. So the denticles are very, very small and they face pointing this way. So they're like little hooks like that facing towards his tail. So if I go this way, it feels very smooth. But if I go this way, see I'm kind of moving him a little bit. Oh, it almost it's like, sticks. It's like sandpaper. It's very, very similar to sandpaper. Some of the bigger sharks are actually, their skin is so rough that if you were to go backwards like that, you would start bleeding because you can tear your hands off. The skate, on the other hand, has all, they still have scales, um, but they're, it's more like a skin. It's very, very smooth. It's more skin-like, but it, it's, it's very small scales. Oh, and here's a quick picture of the underside of the scale. Oh, she turned back over. It's like she knows. Um, there was a question about how many spots she has, and it's <laughs> Again, quite a bit. It, yeah, it's, it very, it's a lot. It's and, an individual pattern. If you were to take pictures of uh, little skates, they all have spot, different spot patterns. Uh, she has quite a bit, and once again, that's just a camouflage mechanism. If you guys think about it, 200 feet down or so, there's light, but there's not a lot of light. So if you live in the mud and you bury yourself in the mud, and then all of a sudden there's like shades and shadows and a little bit of light coming down, that would be the perfect way to hide. In fact, even with our touch tank, what is very well lit like it is right now, when she buries herself in the sand, it is very hard to find her if you don't know exactly what you're looking for. And what do we feed these sharks? So they get a lot of different things. Squid, krill, fish. They get a shark gel, which is full of vitamins for them. They'll also eat um, shrimp. They'll eat little bits of clam or scallop if they have available mussels. Uh, their two favorites are obviously the fish and the squid because as adults, that's what they're going for more often. The babies are much more versatile and will eat a lot of different things. And how often do we feed them? We feed them three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Now, they don't have to eat every single one of those days, but we do offer them food those times. So we talked about um, feeding them. What do you plan on feeding them today? Today we're going to be feeding them fish, chopped up fish that I have. It's one of their favorites. So I decided to go with that today, see if we can entice them to eat. Like I said, they don't, because they're a cold water species, they don't eat every single day. They don't have to, but they may surprise us today and have a little bit. The skate will definitely eat. She's, she's always about eating. I'm just um, scrolling back through the questions because we've had so many great ones just to make sure that I have not missed any. Oh, hello from Florida. Hi, Paul. Paul's Hi letting us know the Palm Beach Zoo is still closed. Um, I know. I think we've gotten, awesome. we've touched on all the questions well, so I'm far. I'm going to start feeding these guys, and if you guys do have questions while we're feeding them, just let me know. Okay, so what you're doing is kind of... Just getting a little bit of smell in the water. And we'll see. So I'm going to feed everybody, case. just not the sharks, so the, the sea stars will eat some, the urchins, the hermit crabs. And so you've given a piece to the sea star. Mm -hmm. yep. So the sea stars, well, which we could talk about at a different time, they, they'll eat any sort of meaty substance. So that one right now has a fish head in front of you. This one has a piece of fish. So I kind of just toss it around, letting guys get to it when they want to as well. Give them a good opportunity. The skate, I kind of want to feed her while she's on the glass, just so you guys can get a very, very good look at her underside. Let's see if I can hone in on her. She is definitely moving around a lot today. She knows it's... Every time this cover comes off, she knows either people are going to come over and say hi, or she's going to get fed. So you'll see here she kind of uses her pectoral fins to try to trap it underneath her because her mouth is on her underside. We'll see if we can kind of move her towards the glass. She's quick. Oh, she's very fast. There we go. Oh. You guys can get a kind of a look there. 
And how much does she eat when you, you know, when you feed her? How much do they typically... I mean, she is a little bit of a pig. She, she likes her food. Eat, she'll eat a lot, yeah. She is laying eggs right now. This is kind of their breeding time. So she obviously wants a lot more food um, because it's a lot of energy to make an egg. But typically, I kind of give her maybe about three quarters of a fish. And do you worry about her... Does she have teeth? Are you worried about her biting you when you... Uh, she has kind of like a crushing raspy pad. It's not going to break my skin at all. It's not going to hurt. I don't worry about her biting me at all. Oh, here's a really good question from um, Bev. How do you make sure each animal gets some food? I individually feed every single animal here for the most part. Uh, except for the hermit crabs, I know they're definitely going to get the scraps of everybody else, but I'll give each sea star a piece of fish. I'll try to give the dogfish each a piece, a piece or two of fish. Uh, she, I, just, as you guys saw, I can easily put it right in front of her and she's all about it. But it's not super hard to get everybody to eat from this tank. I mean, it's, the sea star is already cruising looking for so Angie, age nine, um, wants to know how old um, she is. So we have no clue how old she was because she was actually, again, a bycatch. Um, she was caught in a, a scallop trawler. So people were scallop fishing, dragging that big net on the bottom, like I said before, and she came up with the net. So we have no clue how old she is. Uh, the only way to tell how old these guys are is a test after they die. You can actually look at their their spine and you can count the rings on it just like a tree and in each year they throw down a ring so that's the only way to tell how old a shark or a skate or a stingray is unless you hatch them in a tank. So how long have we had her? I mean she's considered an adult she's considered at this an point. Adult. She's grown a little bit since we've had her so she was a little smaller when we first first got her. Uh, we've had her for about two years now give or take. I think she's my favorite touch tank animal. She's, she's always more moving. Ones. She's definitely moving around all the time. She's a blast. Oh, it looks like one of our sharks is on the move. Yeah, they're starting to smell the fish and they're starting to wake up. So he might actually. The thing about these sharks is they use their sense of smell a lot to find the food, and boom, there you go. So he can smell it. They have a he very, just found very, it. very good sense of smell. And so you'll see them moving their head back and forth, looking for food, looking for food, looking for food. And then once they find it, they swallow it right up. So with them, I don't really put the food right in front of their face, just because sometimes it'll startle them. I kind of get that smell going and, and go from there. And so this would, they're foraging right now. Yep, they're foraging. It's a natural behavior that they would do in the wild, something that we always encourage. Oh. Looking for food. And there you go. Swallow it right up. That's a great, great shot of that. And how much do these eat? guys eat they're only gonna they don't eat as much as the skate obviously um they'll eat about you know a third to half of a fish and when i say a fish i'm talking about one that's about the length of an average cell phone um here's another great question from um jessica how big is the largest skate i'm assuming skate species because there's more than one kind the largest skate species in the world so let's talk about the largest ray in the world we'll do that one because skates there's a lot of them that we don't really know a whole lot about because they live deep down they live in the bottom but the largest ray in the world uh, is the manta ray. Manta ray, yeah. Yeah, manta rays. Those guys are whew, 20 plus feet long, give wow. or take, wingtip. So when I say wingtip to wingtip, I mean the edges here, we call these wings. So from wingtip to wingtip, you're talking 20 feet. And they actually eat exclusively plankton. So they eat just little, little microscopic things that are floating in the water. So this guy's still looking around. Oh yeah, they're gonna keep looking around for quite some time. Who would you say the, is a better hunter or forager in here? Is the skate? Sea stars. Sea stars, <laughs> really? Sea stars are the biggest predators I have in this tank, without a doubt. Everybody always thinks it's the sharks or the skate. She's always moving around. The sea stars are the most voracious, the most aggressive eaters, uh, the hungriest out of anybody in this tank by far. So, doubt, a, Angie is asking. H nine is asking. What's the population in the wild? So we said that the. So everybody in this tank is least concerned. So their populations are going up. This James dogfish, like I touched on earlier, have a very, very high population because all the fish that we love to eat, uh, loves to eat them. And we're taking those guys out by the millions of tons every single year. Uh, the skate, again, least concerned. The species that we uh, eat are the species that like to eat them. Again, same idea. So no problems with them at all whatsoever. Um, and that's good for them, bad for the environment as a whole. Like I said, because we're just taking out the, we're messing up the natural balance. 
And where would we find them in the wild? So these these the guys dog, are the chain dogfish are going to be along the Atlantic Ocean, along coastal waters, right around uh, excuse me, about two hundred feet or so to a thousand feet. Uh, they like that cooler water. The skate won't go as deep, but she definitely likes the cooler water as well. Um, and right around you know hundred ish feet, it goes a little bit deeper. I'll give you a quick look at the starfish. When um, I panned on it before, you had just given it a piece of food, and now it looks like so it's that is a North pulled it in. Eastern sea star, or common sea star, it's wrapped up, it's eating something. But like I said, we'll talk about that at different days since you guys go yeah. for elasma breaks. There's a good look at the shark's tail. Mm -hmm. Where do we find him in the wild? Let me just, just yeah. making sure. So, fun fact on that tail, like I said, guys, it's called heterocycle where that top part right here is much, much longer than the bottom part where you see down here. Every single shark has a tail like that, even the mako sharks, where it's very, very close. If you look at it, the top is still longer than the bottom. No matter what species of shark you're talking about, that's called a heterocycle tail. They all, all have that. So Logan, age eight, was asking about predators for the sharks, and we talked a lot about the cod and other cod, larger cod, fish. Cod, haddock, uh, other bigger dog sharks, uh, Dogfish will eat them, so other different species of shark will eat them. What about the skate? Same idea, guys. So the skate's going to be eaten by cod, pollock, haddock, um, halibut, any of your big ground fish uh, that are popular for fishermen. Uh, big dogfish will eat them, things like that. So you mentioned that um, this feet, that she's our skate's a female, and mm -hmm. she's laid some eggs. She has, yeah. um, how many eggs do they lay? How long do they take to hatch? So it's usually 100 to 200-ish days for the eggs to hatch, uh, depending on species for skates. Uh, if you guys have ever seen a mermaid's purse, or you can Google it, that's what their eggs look like. That's what these sharks' eggs look like. They all kind of look similar. Uh, the little end tendrils are what make it look different. Uh, she usually will lay for a few months. So in the wild, it starts in late April and kind of goes on from there. Sometimes a little bit earlier, depending on the season. She thinks I'm going to feed her again. <laughs> but, um, and it takes a little while. So what they'll do is, I'm actually seeing if she laid any eggs recently. So she will... She'll bury them? Bury them in the sand. Uh, they're very sticky. Um, or she makes a little sticky mucus around them. And they'll stick to rocks. They'll stick to things that are in the sand. And that's kind of how they hide. So you never know if there's one in here. So I always like to look around after I feed them just to make sure. Um, but if I don't find any, if you guys just Google mermaid's purse, skate egg, dogfish egg, any of that stuff, you'll pop up and you'll be able to see it. It's pretty cool. Uh, just kind of going through, making sure I haven't missed any questions. This has definitely been fun to try and follow these guys around. The sharks are definitely... Oh, yeah. Once you start feeding them, they start becoming way, way more active. They've been good about letting me get them on camera. Yeah, so I don't think she has any eggs in here today, guys. Uh, maybe next time when I do it, when I do the sea star chat, if somebody wants, or the number chat, if somebody wants to remind me, I will look for eggs again. And so for um, folks, when we are open, the touch tank um, is open pretty much every day. Touch tank's open every single day. Uh, the times just kind of change a little bit, depending if it's a weekend or a holiday. Uh, that will be posted online. Uh, it's always been posted online, I want to say. But yeah, we're open. We have the touch tank open. And if you guys come at a time where the touch tank is closed, don't worry. Usually, unless it's the very end of the day, we're going to be opening it up again at some point. Right. And that's just to give our animals a break, obviously, uh, because we do get a lot of guests sometimes coming in wanting to touch them, which they don't mind, but after a while, we do want to give them um, some time to relax. And we do, just for folks out there that are wondering, we do have other tanks in the back, too, where if I start to notice somebody's getting touched a little too much or I really want to give them a break, I can put them in another tank that's attached to this one, and they can have a nice, long vacation in there. Here's a great question from Marco. Why are they called dogfish? You call them dogfish and mm -hmm. chain... Yep. Or cat so sharks. They're called chain cat sharks or chain dogfish. The cat sharks, I believe, comes from the eye because their eye is kind of like a slit. So they look like they have a cat's eye. There's also a whole cat shark family um, that they kind of group into as well. Dogfish is just kind of a term that you, we use for a lot of bottom fish that are bottom um, 
sharks that are around here, the dogfish uh, grouping. So that would be, you know, spiny dogfish, smooth dogfish, chain dogfish, a lot, a lot of different ones. And that's an old uh, sailor slash fisherman term that they gave them a long, long time ago. I've heard a couple different stories where they said it, the meat was only good enough to feed to the dogs and, and a whole bunch of different stuff. Some people even say they bark like a dog, but I've never heard that. So a lot of different stories. Fishermen kind of make up the names. Um, that's Again, I said it a couple times. That's why science uses those big fancy names so we don't get confused. All right. Well, I'm just going to follow these guys for a couple more seconds. I don't see any more questions coming in, so I want to thank you folks for joining us on today's virtual Keeper Chat. Um, there is a donate button if you are so inclined. I uh, would love to have folks donate to the Buttonwood Park Zoological Society. Um, your donations help to fund these virtual Keeper Chats and a lot of our um, programs and events that we are bringing to you now while we're closed and continue on once we're open. Um, so a big thank you to everybody for joining us today. And uh, we hope to see everybody again tomorrow at 11. So goodbye from the Buttonwood Park Zoo and from our touch tank.